Hey everybody, it's Jeff. Welcome to the Daily Evolver on Thursday, October 19th, 2017. And today we're going to talk about something that I've been interested in for a long time, but have had this strange sort of phobia and amnesia and confusion about for the longest time. And that's this uh, movement into cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and so forth. And what's I think interesting to evolutionaries is that these present themselves at least, and, and we're going to look at that, as the next thing in the evolution of how human beings exchange value. You know, we start out with barter and trade and move up to coins and, and, and you know, that evolves into, we have this big global financial system that is uh, amazing and remarkable and an, an enormous achievement in the lower right quadrant of reality for the integral geeks, but also has its problems and some serious ones. And so what's next? Something's next. We know that. So I'm joined today to think this through by my producer, Corey DeVos, who's the editor-in-chief of Integral Live and the producer of Integral Live, the uh, live web station that we're on. Hey, Corey. Hey, guys. How you doing? I'm doing great. Excited. Cool. And our special guest is Ryan Olke, who is an old friend. And actually, uh, I've, I've worked with his company, Power Up, when Ryan was here in Boulder. And Ryan, you're now in Asheville, right? I'm in Asheville, yep. The, yeah. the Boulder of the South. Yes, indeed. <laughs> and, um, and Ryan is, as I said, the uh, uh, owner and founder of uh, Power Up. And it's a boutique creative agencies for all things weird and intangible, right? <laughs> yes, that's a good way of describing it. <laughs> Virtual teachers, healers, you know, all, all those kinds of, of wonderful people that uh, fill up Boulder and Asheville. Yeah, indeed. And also the author of a book that I'm really enjoying. I mean, I really feel like you have a, a wonderful way of explaining this. Your, your book truly is Cryptocurrency for Newbies. That's the title. Yes. And, and you deliver. Excellent. So I'm a newbie. So, so Ryan, let me just sort of lay out how I'm grappling with this. Yeah. And, you know, because we Perfect. had a, a, a seminar on this. Some guy came in, oh, you know, maybe 2008, 2009 at Boulder Integral and did a half day seminar on it. Really? And, yeah, 2008, yeah. 2009? Yeah. Ooh. And I forget who he was. Did you get any was. Bitcoin? Did you buy any Bitcoin then? No, I, I oh, left. Did you wish I, you did? <laughs> I, I wish I had, of course, I wish I had. But, wow, uh, that's amazing. I know. But, no, but un unfortunately, I left more confused than I arrived. Yes. And this is where, you know, uh, you know, I'm in my 60s now. And I think, you know, maybe it's good that I have to die. Because <laughs> I have no idea what you people are talking about. <laughs> And where you propose to take alone. this world. I don't yeah. think you're alone in that. I mean, uh, even regardless of age, like uh, in writing that book, I, I wrote that basically because that's what I was having to do. I had to struggle so hard to find answers. And I'm fairly competent with technology. But right. yeah, you feel like you have to have a, a degree in computer science. So you're not alone in that. And a feeling yeah. just more confused when you hear about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I love what you said about that. I don't have to understand the chip in my phone in order to use it. Yeah. And so that's how I want to sort of enter this discussion. So, Excellent. you know, yeah. it's, it's a, I sort of laid out this sort of evolutionary view of money and exchange yeah. and so forth from barter on up to our global, global financial system. And in fact, we do have or de facto, we have a global financial system. I can travel yeah. most anywhere with my credit card and buy things. I can have things shipped and so forth. Right. But as the cryptocurrency people point out, that's uh, created by these great repositories of information. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of our privacy and, you know, these central banks and credit card companies mm -hmm. and so forth. And they have all of the problems that arise when you try to create walls in this yeah. world, you know, yeah. of this digital world. Yeah. And cryptocurrencies uh, sort of solves that problem and moves forward. So, you know, as best you can, am I, you know, am I on track here? And, and, and what do you think? How, how yeah. would you help me understand the next step? Yes. Um, you know, and as you probably saw in the book that uh, one of the things I say is that trying to boil cryptocurrency down into 
one single definition is incredibly hard um, because there's so much happening here. I mean, even when you talk about an iPhone, like you don't have to understand the technology behind it, but you get a sense about how much it does. You can make calls, you can do email, you can record videos. There's a lot going on that makes having an iPhone profound. The same thing with the internet. That's usually actually what I compare cryptocurrency to in terms of its potential impact. I'm not going to say it's literally the same kind of impact as the internet, but it's not far off in my opinion. So when we think about the internet being created, um, you know, even if we think about 30 years ago of wherever the development of the internet was, it would have been hard to wrap our minds around what the internet has become. Let me just say, yes. I sold my business in 1995, not uh, so long ago. Yeah. We didn't have email. Wow. Yeah, I was wondering, I was trying to think back. I'm like, you know, it was around, but how many people were really using it? So that's fascinating that, yeah, you weren't even using email. Yeah, we were, we were sending around those manila envelopes where people sign their name and pass it on to the next person. Wow. 1995 was when 1995. I got 1995. Yeah, that, yeah. Was, that was when I got my first email address when I went to college, actually, 1995. Yeah. Yep. So we see that these things really, when, you know, the, the idea whose time has come yep. enters the arena there's a great sucking sound as we like, yay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. You know. Yep. Well, you know, up front it's disruptive. So that's part of what's going on here is that I think more people are aware of cryptocurrency than say the internet when it was coming up. People are hearing about it, especially because there's a lot of money you can make if you know what you're doing and you invest early and even if you know how to trade it. So can I think I just interrupt just to say yeah. that this, this is just from your book. You talked about yeah. it's a hundred billion dollar industry now. Started at 60 billion now. Oh my God. Yeah, and, when I wrote it was that, seven billion at the beginning of this year. Yeah, it's and peaked now over 170 billion. Yeah, it's peaked over 170, and it's seeming to. All right, so you got my greed glands pumping. Yeah, man. the greed glands. Everybody understands that immediately. They're just like dollar signs. I get that, <laughs> but understanding what the hell you're you're buying into is a whole other thing. So, um, I think the easiest thing is to kind of just start with what cryptocurrency that word. A little bit and talk a little bit about Bitcoin. And I want to avoid getting into too much nerdery behind it, but you have to unpack a little bit in order to know what this is. So the, the, the word cryptocurrency has crypto and currency in it. Now the currency part is, you know, we know about Bitcoin and Bitcoin is used as a currency in terms of making transactions of holding a store of value. Um, but a lot of cryptocurrencies are not currencies. I mean, they can work as currencies, but they're doing something totally different. So I want to say that up front and we'll get to some examples later that are, that are easy to understand in terms of the concept. Um, but I just want to make that point that actually not all cryptocurrencies are currencies, but Bitcoin being the biggest one is what uh, people know and, and that's what they think of with currencies. So um, part of it is that the currency is uh, decentralized which you're pointing out the walls. So like in centralized banking, you know, all the, the money is handled. The Federal Reserve handles the, the money in the United States. It issues money. It decides when to issue, how much money. It's, we're constantly adding more and more money to the economy. And banks are sort of intermediaries in order to make sure that the money system works. So that way when I pay you, that you know I actually have the money. The money actually gets to you. And I can't double spend that money. I can't go and like take the money back from you. These things seem really, really simple and we take it for granted, but that has to happen. Somehow we have to have that happen. Otherwise we couldn't make digital payments. If you make cash payments, it's easy. I give you a $20 bill, you take it, it's done. But digital payments, that's much more complicated. And it wasn't until Bitcoin that somebody um, figured out an alternative solution to that simple problem of like, how can I make a payment without an intermediary a third party person, a group of people who I have to trust to handle that. And how do I know the value? You know, the I know the value of a dollar. I have the well, value of a Bitcoin? Yeah, so here's the difference. So what's funny is that people think a dollar is a dollar. So let's start with that. And if, you, if you're if you an uh, investor in the investment market, you know that the value of the dollar changes against the value of the euro. So for example, the euro has been going up in value compared to the dollar. So we take that for granted. We think the dollar is something that never changes. It's always the dollar, but that's not true. And, the, and I make this point in the book um, that you just have to ask a grandparent, how much did a car cost whenever, 1950? A car is a car, you know what I mean? Or a house is a house. Things get somewhat better, but milk is milk. Why does milk cost more money? You don't even have to have economic degree to understand that something is weird there. That milk, a gallon of milk costs more money. 
due to the dollar changing in value, but it's way more stable right now than Bitcoin. So I don't, I'm not really freaking out about if the dollar is going to be worth half as much tomorrow. It sort of happens slowly over time that dollars change, but it does. Even in just one lifetime, you know that the value of the dollar changes. So right now, cryptocurrencies are volatile in terms of the, the value of it going up and down. I mean, just today it, uh, and yesterday, it went uh, probably a $400 swing, I think, if I have to look at the, the chart. You know, it went down to like, uh, I don't know if it went down to 5,000 or if it was 5,400. Now it's back up to 5,700 a Bitcoin. So right now, people are putting money into it much like people put money into a company of sorts. And as much money as people are putting into it, as much as uh, that they say they will buy and sell it for, that's what it's worth. Okay, who's it? They're putting money into it. Yeah, what so we'll talk, it? right. And part of this understanding cryptocurrencies, we have to bounce around a little bit because it's so hard to put into one single yeah. box. Of like, in some ways it's really, really simple, but in other ways, what it is and the impact beyond the technology is, okay, uh, give me the no, simple one. The simple yeah. one is, as far as I know, yes, th this network of people create these Bitcoins, which are assigned a value. There's a limited number of these that are going to be created, yeah. 23 million or something. Yeah. And, uh, and they are created in some regular way yeah. uh, that I, this completely escapes me. Yeah. And I, uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so, the, so that I could buy one of these yeah. somehow yeah. and own it. I, I, can I spend it or is it just something like a bond or, you know, something that I would own as an investment? Yeah, you can use it. So the Bitcoin network is meant to deal with transactions. So it's meant to be deal with that value exchange. So you have a Bitcoin, you can, you can send that Bitcoin to somebody else for whatever reason. That's the, the simplest thing. The value of, of what you get for that is not something that the network itself decides. That's like what we decide socially amongst ourselves. Yeah, by, but, by an open market of buying and selling them. Yeah, by an open market, right. Um, now the, the network is actually, Bitcoin is a protocol. That's what it would be called, it's just a protocol. It's a series of um, rules that, are, that sort of are impossible to change. That's the thing about this network. So when you exchange a transaction, there is a protocol of how that transaction is verified to be true, to verify that I have that Bitcoin and I can give you that Bitcoin and that now you have that Bitcoin. And there's a ledger, a history of it. Just like I give the example of an old school paper ledger where you write down accounting stuff. That's essentially what we're talking about is a historical record, uh, but one that cannot be manipulated. Of that the, particular Bitcoin? Of every single Bitcoin, that exists. Ha, every single Bitcoin has its own history. Essentially, yeah. It's okay. all baked into um, the network. It's a transparent ledger that anybody can see. You can go online right now and you can look at the Bitcoin network. You can look at people's wallets and you can see all the transactions that have ever happened and you can follow it. We know that actually the founder, um, Satoshi, uh, we don't know if it's a single person we don't know, man, woman, group of people. But I know this thing is so romantic too. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's really cool. But they have a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin that they have never spent. And we know that because we can look at the, the blockchain. We can look at the ledger. So yeah, that, that, it's a big deal that one, it's decentralized. Nobody is controlling it. The protocol is what it is. And it can't just be changed because a few people decide that they want to do something different. Unlike, for example, the Federal Reserve decides for us, what we do with our money. And I'm not even saying that with any political charge. I'm just saying it's just sort of matter of fact. That's, yeah. well, <laughs> that's how it works. It, it, it's been a great system. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it, yeah, exactly. So there's reasons why we've had it, but yeah. that's the difference. So like this protocol exists and everybody knows and knows how it works and it just works. And there are people who participate in the network through this thing called mining and we're, we don't need to even get into that, but basically they're doing computational work in order to pump the transactions of the network in order to verify it, that it's true. And you, you just can't manipulate the network unless everybody would know that it's happening and it wouldn't, just, it wouldn't be able to be carried forward. So it's transparent, it's decentralized, meaning that nobody can control it. And it's really effective. It's, effect, it's more effective in certain ways than traditional banking. In other ways, subjectively, it won't feel that way. But you know, when you go make a payment, you always have those pending charges that pin for a day, two days, three days. Mm -hmm. There's a time in, in Bitcoin for a transaction to be confirmed and completed. 
It can be as fast as I think technically 10 minutes, but it's usually 20 minutes or, or more. This is a big deal. Some cryptocurrencies are faster than, than Bitcoin. But basically, the transaction is com totally complete. It's done. You're not pending for three days. So that's okay. a, you know, it's efficient, decentralized, and transparent to everybody. But anonymous, meaning I can see, you have a, if you have an address, a wallet with Bitcoin in it, everybody can see what's been done with that in terms of just Bitcoin's moving. But I don't know that you own that address. I don't know, don't know who I bought with it. Yeah. And that's a big deal because so much of our money and, and finances in, in our economy is hidden. It's not really transparent uh, to us. Right. So, all right. So, well, yeah. it's, it's, it's it, you know, briefly, it's, it's also sort of ironic because right now the cryptocurrency space is very much Wild West. I mean, we're, we're very, yeah, you totally. know, we're sort of like the internet when Netscape came along, right? It's, it, yeah, it, yeah. <laughs> but we're still in, you know, the very early days. But what's interesting is, unlike the Wild West, it's really, really difficult to rob the bank because, you know, one of the main differences that, that, that most cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, et cetera, offer you is rather than having that centralized ledger that, you know, exists in some room somewhere and is, you know, is protected Corruptible, by or, or what yeah, have you that can yeah. be, be stolen, yeah. literally the only way to hack Bitcoin is to simultaneously hack every other node in that network. Simon. Yeah, the, the amount of hacking power you would require is, you know, it's just almost, it's almost impossible. I mean, that's right. basically the thing is saying, I mean, there's theoretically ways to do it, but it just, it just, it's, it's like exponentially, like astronomically, <laughs> uh, right. the chance of that happening is hard. You can't just pass a note to the bank teller and, uh, yeah, right. you, and you can't change it. Actually, everything that's happened before. So the ledger, right? So all the transactions that have happened since Bitcoin came out you would have to go back through and alter every single, the further back you want to mess something up, you have to go back and alter an incredible amount of data that is incredibly complicated to do. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of an exponential factor versus like we might see in a movie of somebody going in and like, I'm going to log into the computer and I'm just going to change this one entry and then no, nobody's going to know. Yeah. No way. You can't do it. It's, you just can't do it. Well, it, <laughs> feels that, like, it feels like the simplicity beyond complexity. Mm. If yeah. You know what I mean? You totally, know, like global financial system is astonishing, but you know it's a big old creaky thing. Yeah, and and, and this is a simplicity beyond that, where it's just an elegant transaction of value, yep. uh, without any middleman and without yep. any you know, uh, it, it's like you say, safe and instantaneous and so forth. Yep. And I want to ask you, uh, so how would I use this? How would you use Bitcoin? Uh, yeah, how would it be? And, and think about just well, our regular listeners here. Would yeah. we buy these things and just hold on to them as an investment, or would we actually use them? Well, I'll and tell you right how now. How do you use one hmm. Bitcoin that's worth a hundred, you know, eight hundred bucks? Do you sell? Do you use bit, the pieces of it, or you know, how does that work? Well, the yeah. first thing, the first thing I'll say, Ryan, I'll let you answer in just a moment. But the first yeah. thing I'll say is, as one thing you can do with your Bitcoin is actually purchase an Interval Life membership. <laughs> um, you take do you, do you Bitcoin. Bitcoin? You take oh, that's Bitcoin. Awesome. Yeah. Oh my God. That's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. So the, the usage of these cryptocurrencies is something that's evolving. So kind of like the internet wasn't super awesome in the beginning and it got better. And then as it got better, more people use it. It's, I don't know, sometimes it's a chicken and egg sort of thing because in order for it to evolve, people have to actually use it. And so that's a big conversation of Bitcoin can be used very simply. If somebody accepts it, then, then you can use it. Um, but the question is of user you adoption. You can use of fractions or something. You can, yeah, you can, yeah, you can use fractions. So one of the other technical definitions of sort of money is that you can have a unit of measurement that's easy. Now we have dollars, a dollar bill, $20 bill. We have these denominations. But Bitcoin can be divided down into like incredibly small fractions, um, which brings up another opportunity, which we don't have to get into at this moment or even in this conversation, is microtransactions. So... Um, there's a whole new world of like, what does microtransactions allow? But when you go to a coffee shop or some store and they say, you can't use your card unless you spend $5, there's a reason for that. That's because they get, they have to pay the intermediary a chunk of that. And it's not worth them paying that the fee. The credit card but, company. Yeah. But if that, if there is no fee or if that fee is really tiny, what possibilities does that open up, especially in a digital world, you know, in physical reality, there's only so many people that can pass through a door and, you know, and pay for something, but online, it's there's it's wide open so you can use bitcoin i mean that's the case and you'll find people who are accepting bitcoin right now i think a lot of people are holding 
uh, Bitcoin as an investment. Okay. Because if it's, it is um, deflationary, meaning that like there is a limit to how many Bitcoins will ever exist. Um, so you don't have to worry about the value going down due to more and more coins just being created out of thin air. Um, but the more users that have it and the more that it becomes integrated, I, uh, you know, pe more people are holding it, the more likely I think it will be used. But there's a big question because we're talking about right now, Bitcoin is the biggest one. I mean, it just has, it has, I don't have to look at it, what the last market cap was, but it was at least 70 billion. Like they have, it's, no, it's probably 80 billion. It has 54% market dominance right now. Um, so it's pretty big, mm -hmm. but when you look at, you know, the world economy and how much money's out there, 170 billion is it, on one hand, it's a lot, it's significant, but on the other hand, it, we're just getting started. Right, <laughs> so totally. most yeah. people are holding it, waiting for it to be, um, yeah. Held well, on. that raises another question. If, as you say, we ping pong around a little bit here to get this yeah, yeah, picture totally. painted. Uh, there are a number of different cryptocurrencies. Yeah. So all of a sudden I'm confused again. Yeah, totally. Well, so there's different buckets and actually- There's 900 there's of them, didn't you say in your book? That, that at the time I wrote 900 listed on coin market cap and there's even more now. There was a- I, I'll, I'll, bet, I'll bet you a, a dozen new altcoins were created since we began this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, they're slowing oh. it down a little bit with the whole um, ICO thing and you know, governments and SEC getting a little bit more, sending out some warnings, but there are a lot of them. But that's why I say there, there are different buckets and categories of, the, of cryptocurrencies. So some of them are currencies in the very simple way that we discussed. You can make payments. It's just better in certain ways um, than what we currently have. But that's some true. of them are not currencies at all. There's a cryptocurrency that's um, trying uh, to help with uh, identification verification. So think about this. What the, the main ID in the United States is a social security number. That's the most fundamental one. Everybody has it. You have to give that thing to people and, and Equifax, just yeah. that whole thing, just yeah. screwed so many people. And now somebody can take your ID and they like, and they can go and get credit. So the thing is, is like, what if it would be possible for you to, to let another person know that it is really you without them ever having to see your actual ID? Yeah. Yeah. That's it's what's happening with cryptocurrency in terms of security. So there's a way in which... I can provide you some a, a public key, a public version of this that that ties to my identity that only I could have. I could only send out a sort of message transaction or verification from this identification. Nobody else could have it unless I gave it to them. So you can verify it's me, but you don't get my ID. It's the same thing with the Bitcoin wallet. You have a special private key that only you have that you never have to give to anybody at all. Yet you can still conduct trans transactions. And so, it's a private digital key. Yeah, you know, it's, it's on, it's, on your on your computer. Yeah. You know, I read these horror stories on Reddit of these people who like had a Bitcoin on their computer and threw it away, and yeah. that yeah, Bitcoin's gone forever, and it would have been worth a half a million dollars. And, yeah, so there's ways. I would say that with more security, sort of comes more risk in a, in a certain way. I mean, you know, um, it it can only be that secure if it's that easy to lose you know if you don't have your private key and you, you don't have it backed up it's gone forever um you yeah, know, more personal yeah responsibility more personal but there but there's interesting ways yeah, you for, gotta you gotta protect your money too you yeah know, you, yeah, yeah. And, and, and ryan just yeah i just want to interject here we just got a comment from our friend david satterley who's who's yeah. um, saying basically what you're saying which is yeah. the exciting thing is that blockchain technology is so much more than cryptocurrency it's yeah. an agnostic transaction platform Blockchain yeah. is being developed to manage medical records, energy grid yep. management, and yep. and what all else. A absolutely. Um, I've, I've seen a lot of projects that are, you know, starting to look, hey, maybe this is a platform by which we could actually create a universal basic income, uh, a workable system for universal yes. basic income. I mean, people are, are, what's interesting about this space is that people are dreaming really, really big. And they're, you know, in terms of sort of the ideologies that people bring to it, I find myself having like really enriching conversations with people who, if we were talking sort of within a political context, the conversations would probably generate a lot of friction really quickly, right? It gets, it gets difficult when you have, you know, an anarchist talking to a socialist, talk, you know, it, 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 yeah, the, it gets right. messy real quick. But in the crypto space, you know, I'm starting to see all these, you know, almost strange ideological hybrids. I mean, people talking about, 
you know, decentralized socialism. I mean, what, you know, people mistrust yeah. the concept of socialism because it is so centralized. It, it, it yeah, creates yeah. so much central power and authority. And, and here we actually have the opportunity to, to have a different kind of conversation about these things um, that yeah. uh, in a lot of ways transcends the, the, both the, the limitations of previous structures and, and also, you know, curtails um, a lot of the problems that, that sort of come out of that level of thinking. Yeah. Well, and that's, um, it's a good point to bring up uh, the different ways that blockchain and kind of similar technologies are being used, but it actually gives the possibility for things to be implemented because you, you need technology or solutions sometimes in order to match an ideology. So like universal basic income is a awesome one. I think blockchain has the best chance of delivering on that. You know, we sort of have, you know, when you think about social security in the United States, that's sort of like a thing of like, as long as you're a citizen participating in this workforce, you're supposed to get something back theoretically, you know, and, but it takes a lot of effort. There's a lot of moving parts in order for that system to exist. Mm. But uh, many of the cryptocurrency networks are networks that say, if you participate in this network, whatever it's doing, whether it's money or something else, you're going to get value back from it automatically by just simply being a participant and user, which is very different. If we make a, a silly example, um, like Facebook, that's opposite. You use Facebook, they keep all the billions of dollars, basically. Right. They give you this the ability to post shit on Facebook, but that's not, come on. You know what I mean? Like if they gave you a little bit of, of that value for being a participant on it, all of a sudden it's much more um, participatory. You feel like you're part of that network. So universal basic income would be something similar. You're part of this thing and it just spits out yeah. automatically through incredibly efficient technological means. There's yeah. a solution there that makes you know, it easy. I'm not um, saying, but just that's an idea. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, wow. It's, it, I'm sitting here thinking, wow. Um, how, say that again, Ryan. Or, or, yeah. You know, the, the idea is is that we would be part of networks where we would be uh, participating in the value created by the network. Yeah. Uh, like what yeah, would me, that look like? Let me give you. Yeah, I'll give you an example that's um, similar to Facebook. It's a platform called Steemit. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to relate to. So basically, it's I, I think it's more similar to Medium in a certain way. Um, where you can write articles and when you write an article and people like it and view it, you get steam, you get um, the, the cryptocurrency. So when steam, it's not keeping all of it like medium or Twitter or Facebook would. So if you create something of value and users like it, you get a uh, cryptocurrency for that. Now I, I mentioned this book. The question is, is like, okay, well then what can I get with that? Because exactly. it has to get, and that's a problem that needs to be solved. Can you currently just in this example with Steemit, can you get something with that? Or is that just sort of they don't, symbolic? I would say and, right now they don't really have too much there for that. I, I, but it's an idea that's really simple to understand, which is why I use it. Um, another one that's coming up uh, is basic attention token, um, which goes with the Brave browser. And what they're trying to do is when you give your attention to advertisers, they're going to give you something back. And, 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 um, there's just more of a relationship between you, advertisers, and content creators in order to exchange that, that value. Now, actually with them, they're still developing it. So the question is, what are you gonna get with that? You know, I'll, that's really the question with um, all the cryptocurrency networks when they're, when they're doing the value thing. Bitcoin is supposed to be just, you have the Bitcoin so you can spend it. But yeah, and the I, think, I think it is... will emerge. I think that will emerge later when there's enough people using it. But you know, if, if I got, basic attention tokens, for example, from an advertiser, I can then use that to then create ads. So, you know, like on Facebook, if people, if Facebook gave me money for attention, I could then use that to create ads and that would give me value because then I would bring people to my business. So it's a, it's a complementary circular environment of sorts, I would guess. Does that make so sense? So if, if, if I wrote something and people liked it, then I could use those points to yeah. buy something else, at least within the network from people or buy a yes. service from yeah. another person in that network. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's one of the big things that's coming out of cryptocurrency is like just making everybody feel they're a part of it. Like tangibly, you have skin in the game and yeah. the, network, the network only builds because people participate in it. So Bitcoin is that way too. Bitcoin only grows if people are participating in it. Yeah. If people stop participating in it, nothing happens. Say the same as any other sort of, dis, you know, distributed, any sort of business that we see these days that's based on this kind of distributed model where, you know, uh, the, 
Uber is the largest, you know, one of the world's largest transportation companies. They don't own any vehicles. Uh, Facebook is the world's largest content platform. They don't create platform. Airbnb is the world's largest real estate market. They don't own any real yeah, estate. They, but but the but problem there's is still a centralization at the at the very top of yeah, these, these businesses. Those are those are is going to help us sort of wrap around. Yeah, those are all perfect examples of where something like blockchain would be so much better and healthier and at least in my opinion for that kind of a network because that's what's doing everybody is giving value by giving their cars by giving their houses and of course yeah they're getting paid and whatnot but how much value is being taken and held by the bigger companies and is that really proportional and if, if people have the opportunity to choose from a large network like Airbnb where they get more stake in it which are they going to choose? Well, uh, I, I'm getting my mind blown here. <laughs> okay. So, uh, you know, what I'm seeing, and this is helping me, is, you know, this whole system of, of, of capital and yeah. funding these businesses that then work with consumers and, you know, the sort of up and down flow yeah. uh, is distributed or so, somehow made horizontal in a way where value is created uh, and exchanged. Yeah. Without any of that sort of intermediary stuff. Right. And, and, um, and, and if indeed a dozen have been created since we started talking, I'm assuming that there's going to have to be some network of networks or there's going to have to be something yeah. where it's not so hard. Yeah. In terms of making it But really, that's maybe down the road. They're going to have to figure that out. They're going to, these networks are going to have to figure out how to make it really user friendly. And they're not quite there yet, but that's the same thing as like, when the internet came out, it, it was complicated for people. Now you can go to the Mac store right. and just get a simple Apple and boom, you're on the internet. So part of that's natural, but they definitely have to figure that out. Right now they're trying to get the technology down right. So like Bitcoin is going is dealing with scaling. So they're saying, how can we handle more and more and more transactions? Because when you look at how many transactions Visa processes, you gotta be able to scale up to that. And so right. they're trying to figure out how to sort of perfect that. And, Every, every network's doing that. Um, but they also will have to work on how to make it really user-friendly because right now when you, that's the reason why I wrote the book is because it's not so user-friendly. And, and my version of that book is kind of the easiest version I know of, <laughs> but even mm -hmm. that's still hard. It's got to get to the point where like just opening your iPhone and there you go. Yeah. Not there yet. Yeah. And let's, let's be sure to get a plug in here. So if, uh, if anyone is interested in Ryan's book, you should check out crypto newbies.com. Is that right? Uh, yeah, ebook.cryptonewbies.com would be go. the the book. Yeah, yeah. I was making sure. I, was like, I, I gotta say, Ryan, it's it really pulls me through. Mm. I mean, I I get I get it when you write, so I appreciate Good. that. Good. Yeah, I I think we're even getting probably a a, a little geeky on you know, the book. We step by step, slow, digestible, but hopefully this is fleshing yeah. out even more importance of why this is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I wanted to mention too how this intersects with another sort of ongoing conversation that we're having here in Integral Life, which is, um, you know, about a month back, uh, Rob Smith did a uh, presentation exploring his ebook, The Great Release. And I just want to read um, sort of the abstract from the presentation that he gave, because I think it, it, it factors pretty directly into the conversation we're having right now. Uh, Rob Smith explains the current historical moment as a natural and predictable backlash against the twin dominance of the right-leaning multinational capital hole on in economics and the left-leaning multicultural cultural hole on in culture since the 1970s. Both of these forces transcended the nation state in the late 20th century, fomenting a massive equal but opposite backlash in the form of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders supported by the tribalists at both ends of the political spectrum. This backlash is tearing apart the political establishments of both parties as citizens wrestle with the increasingly obvious failures of the rights religion of markets at any cost. This tension is part of a broader great release that the American-led world state is undergoing as its internal contradictions and growing systemic ir ir irresilience since its formation in 1945 become no longer sustainable. Here's, I think, the money shot. The resulting reorganization will increasingly move towards an upgraded trans-statal global governance structure capable of leading the 21st century towards a post-work, post-AI, post-singularity, post-perspectival world. And my sense is cryptocurrency is precisely one of those trans nation state solutions yeah. that is uniquely equipped 
to deal with a lot of the problems that are coming from that, that the fact that we are still operating under, you know, under nation state controlled fiat currency, but within this much larger multinational, uh, you know, system of capital, which creates yeah. a lot of tensions, a lot of, um, and a lot of suffering for a lot of people around the world. And, and this seems to be, um, you know, one of the first, as well, as well as a lot of bounty. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah no. Huge. Yeah, that's a big point. I mean, uh, Jeff, you two had... cheers for capitalism. <laughs> a year and a half for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you mentioned the globalization part, and I think that's a big deal. And that's what we're talking about here: is that we're already in a globalized period, yet the systems we have and solutions we have aren't really keeping up with yeah. that. And so, if anything, cryptocurrency. I think is on the track to provide some of these solutions that match that just match more of what's already happening. It's, you know, so they're, they're working on it um, because it's like, how can we have these silos of, of systems when we already move beyond them? Yeah. Well, and, and can I interject? We got another question, which I think again is, is related to this because of oh. course, as these more, more transnational solutions comes in, we're, you know, it's going to experience a lot of resistance, obviously, yeah. from the nation states who currently have all the power and the military backing behind their currency and so forth. So uh, John asks, what is the motivation behind Goldman Sachs' exploration of cryptocurrencies, i.e., what is the uh, end in view or objective behind the Goldman Sachs interest? I mean, largely to try to um, control or at least regulate this market themselves would be my sense. They don't want to get yeah. left behind. The same reason that, you know, our cable companies are, you know, suddenly – CBS has its own app and NBC has its own app because the system is changing. And if the dinosaurs don't evolve, they're going to go extinct. Yeah. It's, this is a whole another big topic of what's going to happen with uh, corporations with huge interests and, and big pocketbooks and then governments too, of like how they're going to react to that because this is all, it's all disruptive. And for me, it's also just simply matching again what's already happening so partly it's disruptive partly it's just going with the flow yeah and um but it's hard to know i mean there are going to be some fights happening and and goldman sachs is really biz bizarre and, and uh, the jp morgan i mean there's like conflicting messages where you'll one day hear about the banks trying to slam bitcoin yet then they're buying up a bunch of bitcoin so i'd agree with you Corey, that they're trying to make money mm -hmm. then why why not if they can make money um they're going to do it and if they can control it and stop it from, uh, you know, eating at their interest, they're going to do that. I don't really see them embracing it, um, yeah. but it with a, a big heart, but uh, we'll have to see. And government's well, another thing of like what they're yeah. going to do. But it's hard to stop. The thing is, is like something like Bitcoin, there are ways in which you governments and and companies can screw with it a little bit, but you can't control it. It's out of, well, that's the thing, is that, you, you know, you can't contain it. Yeah. yeah, when I was, uh, I watched the, that Bitcoin documentary on Netflix. Banking on Bitcoin. Yeah, banking on Bit Bitcoin. And it, again, this amazing story of this sort of shadowy founder that nobody really knows who he is. And it does he even exist as a number of, of people and whatever it is. And then two of the three uh, founders are in prison uh, uh, of, you know, the first Bitcoin institution. Are you and, talking about um, Silk Road? Well, yeah. Well, no, not Silk Road. The, ex the exchange. What was it oh, called? Oh, the exchange. Yeah, which yeah. exchange? I'm trying I to remember. remember. The Mount, one Mount Gox? The, yeah, Mount Gox, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at, at, at any rate, it's, totally. it's, it's a long and, you know, colorful and somewhat sordid history behind this. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and so, you know, there's been a lot of regulators come in and they yeah. talk about the regulator in New York who yeah. set all the rules Then he resigned his position and became a consultant for businesses who want to use Bitcoin. And yeah. that, you know, steps like that, you, and you, you know, it's a classic sort of corruption there, but yeah. uh, at the same time, you could see how the establishment is slowly, you know, on, on one hand, uh, trying to regulate it. And yeah. on the other hand, you know, they see that this is the future. Yeah, the writing's it, on the wall. It almost makes Bitcoin feel more legitimate. You know, I think a lot of people like me think, you know, is this a bunch of geeks just playing around? And is this something that I really want to be a part of? And yeah. when's the government going to come shut it down? Yeah. And actually, you know, Rand, uh, Rand Paul takes Bitcoins in, in his uh, campaign contributions. Yeah. And, you know, nice. there are people who are uh, just the, the establishment is, 
is is finding themselves attracted to it because it's the future right yeah. you know well jeff you, you you mentioned a really important uh piece here which i actually don't see you know talked about very much but it's it's sort of you know what what are the interior components what are the interior qualities that are either going to uh make cryptocurrency successful or not and wow. obviously uh, you know a tremendous amount of what we project as value comes from sort of you know our lower left quadrant biases and presuppositions and assumptions and all of that and you know for the longest time for for, for years now bitcoin sort of didn't have a lot of cultural value bitcoin was often you know sort of a punchline where if you if you mention to someone that you know talk, talk to them about bitcoin then they're going to think you're going onto the dark web to buy you know russian heroin. brides and and heroin um, and, and ever since, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of the Streisand effect in a certain sense where, you know, as soon as Goldman Sachs starts making a lot of noise about Bitcoin, it gets a lot of people paying attention. And it's almost the more noise and the more, you know, caution they, they throw out there, the more shade they try to throw at the cryptocurrency movement, the more people take notice. And the more people take notice, the more valuable it becomes because there are simply more people participating absolutely and and if it's an idea of, whose time has come absolutely you know once again you know you got my green green glands pumping yeah you know yeah. because if this is indeed the equivalent of the early days of the internet i want to buy amazon yeah yeah, yeah. you know i want to i want to I want to buy, I want to, I want to invest in this. I want to ride some of this up. I, I want to be part of this. Yeah. And uh, uh, so, you know, Ryan, what you talk about FOMO, the fear of missing yeah. out. A yeah. lot of people have that, you know, it, it, in money in general, it's about balancing fear and greed. Yeah. You, you know, it's, it's the classic Buddhist aversion and yeah. uh, attraction. You know, right. Right. so I, I want it, but I'm afraid. And so help yeah. us do that. And what should we do? Uh, you know, as people who might have a thousand dollars to play with or 10 or whatever. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, in one sense, like, you know, I always do the disclaimer if I can't advise people, like, you know, go buy some stuff. Oh, but yeah. obligatory. Advise it's, it's obligatory. It's obligatory. <laughs> but, um, you know, I wrote the the ebook so that people could have enough knowledge. That's one of the things I would say is like, you don't have to be a super geek, but understand it enough. So like, even if you've listened to this entire conversation, you at least have a sense of what's going on here. You know that there's something actually going on there. It's not just vapor and just hype. There's something significant bubbling up here. Um, and, you know, then get a little familiar, at least the under the basic concepts of anything you might get into. So if you want to buy Bitcoin, at least know that it's about transactions and exchanging value. It's like, okay, I know that. I mean, if you don't care and you just like, screw it, I'm just going to throw some money at something, go for it. But <laughs> I would say at least know what's going on. Um, and uh, also try to participate. There's a lot of good groups online, you know, like Corey and I are part of a kind of a small private group of, of friends where it's, we can lean on each other. So like, I don't have to know everything. Uh, we have one of our friends in particular, where honestly, anytime he gets super pumped about something, I'm almost going to like say, I'm going to buy it. Seriously. I pull the trigger. <laughs> and like, yeah. yeah. Corey knows what I'm talking about. So like, <laughs> Oh, what's he lean saying? On each, lean on each other <laughs> to, to about like, cause you don't have to, you know, there's no way to know everything about what's going on in the space. It's ha it's evolving so rapidly and there's a volatility. So, and the, also the thing that everybody always says with this space is be prepared to lose everything and then you'll feel a lot better because it is volatile. <laughs> you don't know, but they, people are also making a lot of money. You know, it's, there's, if, if you're talking about like getting in early days before Amazon was a thing, and that's a no joke, that's not an exaggeration. There could be some bubble-like things happening in the space, but even with the internet bubble, the dot-com bubble, you still have Google and Amazon. Right. Amazon just bought oh. friggin' Whole Foods. So, you know, I think there's going to be huge um, results from some of these cryptocurrencies and you're gonna to have to kind of keep up with it a little bit to see uh -huh. what's happening. But Bitcoin is huge, you know, with over $70 billion market, it's, I, it's hard to imagine that just disappearing overnight. You know, Ethereum is another big one. Uh, the more you get down into niche coins that are just coming up, the higher reward, but the bigger the risk. Yeah. You know, I mean, you can literally have, you know, one, two X, three X, 10 X returns on some of these altcoins um, when they're coming up brand new, you can make a lot of money, yeah. but you could also miss it. Bitcoin is more stable. There's a lot of day traders who professionally trade stocks every day and they trade the hell out of Bitcoin. It's like, and they don't like to screw around. They don't like to screw around with their money. So right. 
if day traders in there, that signifies some sort of level of stability for them to be in Bitcoin and Ethereum every day. Well, you so, know, this movie that we saw had, uh, it was made a year ago, so it's banking on Bitcoin. And it's oh, still yeah. had this, the, what, one of the messages was, it's still kind of hard to buy this stuff and, you know, whatever. But it's a, year a lot easier now. Now easier, yeah. so I can tell you about that. So the, everybody has their, you'll, you'll find that the space is filled with a lot of very opinionated geeks. <laughs> and so just know that like you go on Facebook and ask, Hey, some of my favorite people. <laughs> yeah. Right. You, you say, which cryptocurrency are going to buy? You're going to get some answers immediately. So, which is good and it can be bad, but honestly, one of the easiest um, places to buy Bitcoin, Ethereum and Litecoin is Coinbase. You can go on there. You can either transfer in money from your bank or you can use your bank card to buy some Bitcoin. It's, it's, it's a website. Yeah, it's a website. It's incredibly easy. They have millions of users. It's really, it's an easy, easy interface. It's the first What's one I started on. Coinbase. Um, now, the thing with Coinbase is they're going to have a little bit higher fees than compared to like going into an exchange. Like Coinbase has GDAX. It's their complimentary exchange where you can go on there and buy and sell like traders do. And the fees are really low. So you're going to pay a little bit more potentially. They have options where you're not going to have to pay fees. But also Bitcoin usually rides up, like if it's at 5,400, Coinbase, you're probably gonna be buying 5,450. So eventually anybody who's in the space usually leaves Coinbase and goes to their exchange GDAX or goes to something else. Like Gemini is another really nice one. The uh, Winkleboss brothers from Facebook, they started that. Um, they have Bitcoin and Ethereum. I think that's it, I don't think they have Litecoin. And what's their site called again? Gemini. Gemini. Yeah, I think it's just, I think it's Gemini.com. Yeah. I think they got okay. that domain. Yeah, Gemini.com. Yeah. But um, you can't do a card. You have to do a bank transfer on that one. So Coinbase just really makes it easy. You want to go on there and, you, you know, I think Coinbase, if you do the card thing, it's going to be like 3.99%. But you can transfer in money and then they're not, I think it's a much smaller fee. And it's, and it's a lot faster too if you use your card. If you, interestingly, if you use your bank card, it can take like nine days for the Bitcoin. Yeah, it's going to have a transfer. I think they're changing something where you're going to have access to your coins immediately. So like, and Jim and I has that where I could transfer in some money and I can be pre-credited and go ahead and get my Bitcoin. And I could theoretically, like if Bitcoin goes up, I could sell it real quick on the exchange, then buy back again. Mm -hmm. I just can't take it out of the exchange. It can't be fully mine until the transfer completes. Right. Coinbase, you transfer money and you have to wait like five, seven days before you actually have your Bitcoin in possession. Right. All right, so, so the, here's the big yeah. question for you, Ryan. Yeah. How have you, how have you done? I've done good. Yeah, really? I've done. I wish I would have been in earlier, to be honest, because <laughs> uh, my good friend Vince Horn, um, who we started boosting oh, together, yeah, yeah it, he he uh, got in on Ethereum when it launched, mm -hmm. and I remember him telling me about Ethereum when, and it was fringe to me. It was kind of geeky. He's he's on the fringe usually finding cool stuff. And he's like this. He was in it because he thinks it's amazing. But at that time, I don't know, Ethereum was like freaking 10 cents or some craziness like that. And now it's, you know, $300 piece. But I got an Ethereum. And how do you spell Ethereum? Uh, E-T-H-E-R-E-U-M. All right. Now, I, I decided to finally just get in last December because I was kind of sitting on the sidelines. I did a little bit of Bitcoin prior to that, like when Vince told me about it. Uh, I bought a little bit, but I was like, man, I got to get on this. And I bought Ethereum for like seven bucks back in last December. So wow. ten dollars. Yeah. It's so three hundred plus. You say this has been yeah. An when you look year. when you look at the chart, it is pretty explosive. So I mean, don't expect that. You can get that kind of return on fresh altcoins. You have to do an analysis on it to say this is really actually something ingenious with a good team behind it. They have a smart white paper. They, the, you know, there's some cryptocurrencies being launched from companies who are established, like right. they have an established network, um, like the Kick Messenger app. They have 300 million users and they just launched a cryptocurrency to use inside of that ecosystem. So it's like, wow, that's a real thing. Um, 10X is a, something that they have a card that's working where you can spin your cryptocurrency using a card at a coffee shop. That's a workable product. So you can get into um, folks like I got into 10X and like, um, I don't know, my cost average was like 80 cents and it peaked up around five bucks. It's right around $2 right now. So that happened. But that was something I looked at and I was like convinced. I felt pretty confident that this was a good solution right now. Maybe somebody else will swoop in and beat them, but right now they're leagues ahead. So if you look at the whole market cap, people are talking about uh, what could cryptocurrency market be worth next year or two years or 10 years from now. 
And when you talk about a trillion dollar market, it's not bananas when you look at how much money is in oh, uh, the, the world market. You know, a trillion is, that's still, there's even more potential beyond that. So if there's something meaningful here, it's not going to surprise me that we hit half a trillion or a trillion dollars within the next few years. It's, well, it's just, yeah. and now will it be, I, I can't say for sure that will it be Bitcoin? Will Bitcoin be the biggest leader two years from now? I don't know. Right now, I have no reason to doubt that it's not going to be a big player or Ethereum is not going to be a big player. But the market are, as a whole. Are those is sort of the two big ones? Yeah, the biggest ones, um, let me just pull up CoinMarketCap here, which is um, a great site to look at, CoinMarketCap.com. It lists out all of, um, you know, hundreds of cryptocurrencies and it's it'll tell you basically the sort of average trading price. Again, uh, cryptocurrencies are just traded at whatever people are buying and selling it for. There's not like somebody dictating what it's no, worth. No, no. But Bitcoin is... It's a classic uh, free market. Yeah, I will, exactly. I, will, I, will, I will share this screen, Ryan, so that people can actually see the website. Okay, cool. Yeah, cool. Um, Bitcoin's actually 90 billion. So I, you know, like I, I didn't check on the numbers. So 90 billion. Ethereum is next at 29 billion. So you can see those two are pretty big. And actually, earlier this year, Ethereum got very close to similar market dominance. It, people are talking about the flippening where eventually will it happen that something takes the number one slot from Bitcoin. And Ethereum got close um, earlier this year, but now it's kind of... Bitcoin is pretty far ahead. You can see some other ones there, Ripple. And, you know, anything over a billion dollars is significant to me. Yeah. Um, yeah. What's right, maybe, maybe you could take a moment and talk about my favorite altcoin. Yeah. This guy right here. Which one? Iota. Iota. Yeah, yeah. Iota is a big one that um, I, I really love. And a lot of um, crypto geeks that we know are, are pretty excited about it. So Iota is... Now, to, to break this down into, into understandable terms can be a little hard. I mean, like when you look at their white paper, it's bananas geeky. It's mm -hmm. super scientific. Um, but they're dealing with the Internet of Things and leveraging the Internet of Things. So I don't know if, if that's a term you are familiar with or if listeners are familiar with. But well, it's, it's basically when my, my, my blender can send a Twitter message to my toaster, right? Yeah, anything that can hook that can hook up to online now, that's part of the Internet of Things, and that's rapidly expanding. I mean, we haven't even really hit the stride with that. Yeah. But you're, that's not even, I mean, it's a joke, but that's not a joke. Like the toaster, it's like anything, probably, probably everything in your house will have an option to be your Your that. refrigerator will be able to automatically order food to replace yeah. something you just took off, took off the shelf. Yeah. Right. So you have all these things talking to each other. Now, one is that all that stuff needs to happen in a secure way. You don't want things talking to each other and being hijacked. So there's some of the security that's built into um, these kind of cryptocurrency technologies that makes that much more reliable and safe. IOTA is not even using blockchain. So you're talking about Geeky, we're just trying to define blockchain. They're using something called the Tangle, <laughs> which we're not even gonna get into. But basically they're trying to leverage micro and nano transactions amongst all of these different talking devices and make it cost nothing. You yeah. know, or be, or be free, which is significant, and yeah. try to leverage the energy and the resources available in this wide open network. Because on all these devices, there's usually resources just sitting there being available. You know that you could. Well, that's that's the thing that is so exciting to me when I think about the uh, the ramifications of this is, and yeah. especially the microcurrency and the micro payments that I hadn't really thought about before. Yeah, uh, you know, I want when somebody writes a cool article online, I want to yeah. pay them. Yeah. I just don't want to get my credit card. And exactly. Put, yeah, 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 it's too much. You know, yeah, I want just think about that. to this cause. I want to give money to these people, to whatever. Right. And, but I don't you know, want here's to. A, here's a great bother. example of that in the real world of something similar that I always loved is when um, Whole Foods, at least this was in Boulder, um, where they started doing the roundup thing. That was micro right. to round up. And I was like, genius. I will yes. do that every single time. So round, round up, if you don't know, is, you know, something, my bill is for $10 and 59 cents. Do I want, want to round up to $11 and the, you know, yeah. other 41 cents goes somewhere? Yeah. Yep. Some good. That's, that's some simple. Good so, yeah. And like, you know, if you're getting thousands of visits to your site and every time a person decides that they like something, automatically you just get a little chunk thrown yeah, at A little you. 10 cents, a little yeah. something. And that can add up. That can add up. Yeah, yeah that can so, add up. I, I can envision a wor world now where people really are offering their creativity and, uh, you know, I into this bigger, you know, market of, of the whole world and able to be paid in, yes. in ways that are, um, yes. you know, it's actually a free market. Yeah. You know, yeah. let's, let's let, you know, 
stand up and salute here. Yeah, yeah definitely. And you know, um, another thing related to IOTA that's appealing is with Bitcoin, when we mentioned the miners, the thing you need to just know about that is that it requires these warehouses full of people and uh, having these machines just running. Ooh, you know, fans running, all this massive electricity bills. It's not so awesome for the environment, uh, to be honest. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know what, how that would compare to like all the things that make our banking system run, you know, like resource trade-off. But still, when you think about like, hey, we're making something digital and we're still relying on this just pumping out power, it doesn't seem to add up. Whereas IOTA is a system where that's not going to be required. You won't have to have this power being pumped up in order to make the network run. So there's a lot to, that you can unpack how, in that. How can that be? Well, they're gonna, they're, tr you have to get into their, their technology more, but I mean, basically they're using computers, I'm assuming, and. Yeah, but see, Bitcoin introduced something that was really ingenious, to be honest, it was really ingenious, but it still costs work. So basically, miners are doing essentially a sort of game in order to solve a puzzle. And when they solve that puzzle, they're rewarded with Bitcoin and the transactions are, etched into the into the um the ledger but the sort of thing it's it's not n the power that's being pumped out is, is sort of gamification in, in, a, in a way it's really cool of, of how it works and it's a good solution but if we can have a solution that doesn't require that it'd be good it's called proof of work so that's where you can say it's proof of work it requires work and it's ingenious but it, it just strikes me as like that doesn't seem long term sustainable so yeah. iotas and other cryptocurrencies are saying like how do we leverage what already exists so if um there's a bunch of devices and computers just sitting around and it has free energy can we just make that do the work for us rather than creating devices that is doing nothing but that that's what's happening with mining rigs yeah you know, those things well, are doing nothing but processing the things that need to be processed for the network yeah and that's that it's a, it's a fascinating point and it's one of the reasons why cryptocurrency i think is able to reach sort of the tipping point that it seems to be reaching right now which is that computational power is ubiquitous now yeah ubiquitous i mean in 10 years we're going to be wearing clothing with microchips in it right and um yeah. it, and it's being able to leverage the sheer i mean the fact that we're all walking around with one of these in our pockets that's right you know capable of an insane and just an absolutely mind-blowing yeah. uh amount of computational power um that exists in those things and every single one of us is walking around with it um yeah. it, yeah. It, it, it makes these possibilities um, really, really exciting. And it, you know, it really, I mean, for me personally, it makes me tremendously, it's been, you know, I've, since Donald Trump has been elected, um, it's really easy to get kind of freaked out and it's really yeah. easy to sort of <laughs> slip down, uh, you know, a, a pretty dark and slippery slope into yeah. one flavor of extremism or another. And yeah. for me, this crypto conversation has been, um, just a, a source of tremendous, optimism for yeah me. that's true that's good you know, so Corey, I actually, I actually sort of a tr an, a, a development an evolutionary trajectory here and i'm you know i see this as being the most significant advance in the evolution of money ever since richard nixon postmodernized money by decoupling it from the gold standard so Corey, are you in on this yeah I've got, are you, are I've you got investing a, i've got a, a a sort of pitiful amount of uh investments that well maybe not so pitiful but you yeah, know someone, yeah, someone, mentioned this in the, someone mentioned this in the chat and i think it's really worth um saying out loud is that the tagline of my book is like whether you're investing fifty dollars or thousands and that's important to me because this is open to everybody yeah. like if you all if you just have fifty dollars you can go buy fifty dollars of bitcoin Whereas like with any other investment opportunity kind of thing, you have to have a certain amount of money and that's only open to a certain amount of people and, it's, and it becomes insular. So to me, that's super cool. And that I see a lot more people getting excited about this because they can be a part of it. They like yeah. the yep. technology and you can invest. No, so I love that. that that's yeah. so great. Well, and there's, there's the, the change other is it's a game changer. It's, it, yeah. it really is. It just allows people, it allows everybody. Yeah. You know, now I'm not. Now it should be. It's important to say too that we might also be seeing, sort of um, wealth distribution being replicated in the yeah. space, which, ah, you know, who knows about that? I have some wonderings about that. You can actually look at the wealthiest Bitcoin wallets, and you can see the distribution of wallets and like how much Bitcoin values in them. And it was kind of shocking to me when I saw it. I was like, whoa, you know, because I'm I'm hoping to see some of that change. Oh, it was. Like, oh man, I have to look back at the, at the figure I came up with, but it was something like 95% are, are within, I don't know if it was like 10 wallets, 100 wallets or something like that. Right. It was, mm. it was, 
It's significant. I have to look back at it, but it was, it was shocking. But that might also be just because we're in the early adoption phase and maybe that will level yep. itself out over time. But still, it is still open to everybody. Yep. All right. Well, and John asks, Ryan, can cryptocurrencies be converted to analog currencies and used on a daily basis for cash exchange of goods and services? And that's at, at, at places like Coinbase. I mean, so you could, for example, well, you know, I've got, I've got some altcoins. I could actually exchange those altcoins for Bitcoins and then cash out, right? I could. I could yeah. So there's different, I mean, you can Bitcoin. cash out and cashing out is like pretty quick, but then again, you, you will have to wait for the money to transfer you to bank account. But that's where projects like 10X, um, giving you a card to mm -hmm. use, like you don't have to cash out, you just use your card, which will do the, the um, translation, the exchange from your crypto into the fiat currency at the point of purchase. Mm -hmm. um, and actually there's, uh, is this Omis Omisco? Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, they're an existing company. I think the, the company is called just Omis. I was looking the other day and they have an app already uh, in Asia where people can just pay with this app. They don't need to go through and, you know, when you go to another country, you'd say, okay, I got to go get their currency and now do it. They have an, uh, an app to where you don't have to do that anymore. You just pay. Same principle in cryptocurrencies. Like people got us, we're probably going to solve that problem where if people are holding 10 different cryptocurrencies, you can just use the one you want. Like, is it going to be that only one cryptocurrency is the de facto, you know, currency that everybody uses? I don't know, maybe. But um, there's solutions coming up well, for that. I mean, clearly what we're seeing here is something that's evolving in real time. I mean, yes. it's like we fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, um, but it does feel like it's hit, it's hit that sort of uh, level of sort of legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Where yeah, you know, this year did and that. Uh, if if you, uh, I mean, I wouldn't advise anybody to to spend anything that they can't afford to lose. But right. you know, we all have money that we could play with, or, or you know, if, or if we do, this is uh, this would be something to to uh, maybe find out more. Is yeah. there is there a place where uh, I might go, or my my listeners might go to sort of keep up with this conversation, a subreddit, or some sort of a community, mm -hmm. or so I would stay away from subreddit as a, as a newbie. It's a pretty yeah. toxic and Talk about uh, wild west it's filled with reptiles. Yeah. I would say right now, try to find a group. Like that's what I, right now peer groups are really good. So like I mentioned, Corey and I are part of the group. That's been really nice for us. Um, some groups like on Facebook are little, I don't know. There's not much going on. There's not much depth or like, focus and it can get just spinning out. Um, YouTube is really good. There's a lot of good YouTubers and you can kind of find the one you like. Um, I'm doing some YouTube videos along with this book here or there um, to help translate some of the stuff and, you know, put out news and things like that. But there are some good YouTubers. That's the best place I've found so far is YouTube and finding somebody really reliable. If somebody has 50,000 followers, um, mm -hmm. watch a few of the videos. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. But not, there, are, there are news sites for sure, um, like Cointelegraph and Coindesk. And they're, it's good to see what's going on there. I still think you have to question what's being presented. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Well, we've been at this for an hour, and I think we got it all sorted out. Cool. Yeah. 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 Yes. No, I, well, I, I mean, I will say that, you know, here we are, uh, the Daily Evolver, we're about daily evolving. And I feel yeah. like I have a better grasp of what's next and what's coming in terms yeah. of currency. And of course, something new is coming. This is, you know, the way of things. I see. And, um, totally. It feels like this is definitely worth knowing and um, uh, maybe worth participating in and definitely, again, worth keeping an eye on. Absolutely. So, uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Ryan Olke, author yeah. of uh, Cyber Currency for Newbies. Cryptocurrency for newbies. I'm like, like I was saying, cryptocurrency. <laughs> and, um, and we're also going to, this will be a topic at the What Now conference that we would talk about because it's What Now. That's you know, right. And now. Yeah, that's right. And the conference itself is, you know, about sort of finding uh, ways to, um, to adapt and to sort of cultivate more resiliency in, in the face of all this change, all these disruptive forces. You know, it's, it's one thing if, when, when, society has to withstand a single disruptive force, right? It'd be one thing if, if cryptocurrency was the only thing going on, but yeah. we are getting 
buffeted, just, you know, left and right, wave after wave of disruptive forces that Evolution are- Evolution at hyper speed, man. Absolutely, yeah. better and better, worse and worse, faster and faster. And it's going to for force us into new strategies of self-organization. And I think we're already seeing it happen. Uh, this is definitely a topic we hope to explore more at the end of the year conference. Uh, Ryan, I'm hoping that we can get you uh, into the conference somehow, whether remotely or physically. Um, and just thank you, man. Uh, you, yeah. you, you're, you know, I, I, I love our friendship. I love how you've sort Likewise. of held my hand over this last several months um, yeah. and helped me, okay. you know, sort of get through my own learning curve here. Well, it's and it's I'm fun to do. It. Yeah, man, it's fun to do it with you. And like, I really enjoyed doing this uh, socially and as a community, it's it's a, an all team effort in this cryptocurrency space. So it's nice to connect like this uh, with both Absolutely. of you. And let's yeah. do it again. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank all you for right, having me. Folks. Yeah, thanks for being here. And uh, thanks everybody for watching and listening. And we'll see you uh, again next week on Monday, uh, Monday through Thursday, every day at the Daily Evolver. Bye folks. Bye guys. Bye.